Okay, class, welcome back. In this unit, we're going to discuss cardiac output and the things that contribute to cardiac output. So easiest thing to always remember, cardiac output, which you might often receive to refer to as Q in the literature, um, is the product of cardiac rate or heart rate multiplied by stroke volume, right? And there are different things can that can augment heart rate. There are different things that can augment stroke volume, and they'll all have an input on cardiac output or Q um, here. So what is a normal cardiac output? So um, the easiest way to kind of think about this is generally your heart pumps at about five um, liters per minute. That's a typical cardiac output for most people, somewhere between three to, three to, three to five liters per minute. Uh, and we get this generally knowing that most people pump at around 70 milliliters per beat. Um, and thinking about an average heart rate is about 70 beats per minute, meaning that again, it's going to fall some somewhere around about five liters per minute. Now, the normal range for um, uh, ejection fraction, which is the uh, end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume divided by the end diastolic volume. So basically, this is the percentage of blood that gets pumped um, out of the heart. Um, specifically the left ventricle every beat basically saying that like what's the what's the percentage of volume um, ejected that um, we're pumping downstream relative to what was in the chamber at the end of diastole so again because we're looking at the end diastolic volume which should be greater that's the the volume end diastolic volume the volume of the left ventricle after filling minus the volume after systole Right, so the volume remaining in the ventricle after we've pumped, right? We're looking how much how much of that blood escaped relative um, to what was filled. So it should be around 55 to 70 percent. That's important to remember, right? Some people often think, again, maybe going back to undergrad physiology, that oh, we pump everything leaves the heart. Not everything leaves the heart. There's always a little bit of volume remaining. Um, it's again 55 to 70 percent. The upper limit of normal being about 50 percent. Or sorry, the lower limit of normal being about 50%, and then the upper limit of normal being about 75%. There are some situations, heart failure, different cardiomyopathies, where this will change, uh, but in general, it should stay or, or, you know, in that relative range. Now, hemodynamics, some things to kind of bear in mind, um, that uh, blood flow parallels cardiac output. This will make a lot of sense when we start looking at vascular function in our subsequent lectures um, and we'll really start looking at uh, ohm's law and how uh, resistance influences blood pressure but it will also influence cardiac output too and let's just kind of bear with me here with this with this equation so blood flow um really kind of parallels cardiac output in, in many ways um, and again heart rate times stroke volume is what produces our cardiac output we can also think of cardiac output as um, the driving pressure, right? So um, over the resistance to flow, right? So you can think about it, any situation where we have higher resistance to flow, right? So maybe we have a narrower vessel, right? We're going to have to produce greater force at the heart to, to maintain cardiac output, to keep it equal. So this is why hypertension, right? Uh, can be, you know, so, so, so uh, problematic. Um, Hypertension is often related to changes in vessel tone and diameter that increases the resistance. It makes it harder for the heart to work to maintain cardiac output. And we'll get into some situations um, where that can be, you know, we can make adjustments to that as well as situations where uh, we start seeing cardiac pumping performance suffer. So again, remember, anytime resistance to flow, total peripheral resistance, TPR, increases the driving pressure, the force we have to produce must increase to maintain cardiac output consistent. Remember this equation. So it's analogous to kind of Ohm's law. And we have that again, V equals IR, right? If we kind of do a little bit of math, V over R equals I, right? So if R increases, V must increase to keep I consistent. And conversely, if we have things that re reduce resistance, right? 
um, we can reduce blood pressure. And this will make a lot of sense even more um, when we start talking about vascular function. So again, factors that influence cardiac output. So preload is probably a big one. Um, it's the, the, the degree of myocardial distension uh, prior to shortening. You can think of this almost analogous to what we learn in uh, neural rehabilitation with PNF stretching. Basically, like it's almost like an amortization phase. Um, thinking about plyometrics as well, that little quick stretch prior to distension allows for uh, better pumping on the subsequent beat. So if we have a little bit of stretch, um, we typically see, and this is kind of a, a plot here demonstrating this, so ventricular end of size volume, larger volume, you can think there's going to be a greater stretch on the chambers. We're going to have a greater stroke volume, right? It levels off at a certain point where we start having overstretch and we start seeing, you know, a plateau. Um, but generally, the more volume we have, right, the better pumping out we have. And, that, and that's kind of advantageous for us for exercise when volume may um, increase back into heart through the muscle pump and, and you know, increase venous return. We want to be able to get that out as, as demand increases um, during exercise. It kind of works in synchronous. When we contract our muscles, we squeeze the, the veins, venous return kind of increases. We also, during exercise, have also higher demand. So it, it's a way for us to kind of match pumping performance to the demands imposed on our, on our system, which is kind of, kind of pretty neat bit of evolutionary biology. Um, afterload. So afterload is the force against the, uh, which the ventricles must uh, work against, right? So you can think of it basically as the work the ventricles have to operate against, right, to pump blood. Highly dependent on arterial blood pressure and vascular tone. Vascular tone also heavily influences blood pressure. And that goes back to what we talked about in that previous um, slide, talking about the role right, of resistance to flow and how that affects cardiac output. Now, generally, as you'll see later on, we're pretty in, in a healthy heart and within a certain range of blood pressure, we're pretty afterload resistant like a resilient, we can we can tolerate it to a certain point, we'll, and, but at certain degrees of blood pressure, or if we have a failing heart, we can become very sensitive to change in afflux. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And then contractile state or contractility, we'll touch on this a little bit later. And of course, obviously the heart rate, the byproduct again, our, our cardiac output, or Q, again, is the byproduct of heart rate times stroke volume. So if we increase heart rate or decrease heart rate, that's going to have an effect on cardiac output. So um, one thing to kind of look at as well, too, um, the, you know, the influence of um, the nervous system on uh, pumping performance here. We just, we're just showing, again, the effects of different stimulations, um, you know, since, uh, sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system effect on, um, on cardiac output. Not going to focus a ton on this, but just gives you a plot showing how we can, you know, shift pumping performance to be more efficient under sympathetic nerve sympathetic nervous system activation um, to improve cardiac output at a given right arterial pressure which kind of reflects um, uh, preload so again the thing i really wanted to focus on primarily looking at cardiac output is uh, the frank starling mechanism this again is that concept of increased length or stretch um, or increased ventricular volume leads to enhanced pump performance on the subsequent contraction. And again, think about kind of like how this would be advantageous. Like during exercise, we've got greater venous return than normal. There's going to be greater stretch. So we get better pumping performance to kind of get that volume out. But it also is in sync with the demands imposed on our body too. So um, it's, it's just an example here of what we're seeing, right, normal at rest. And then how this shifts almost during exercise too. So we get, again, greater pumping performance. This is an inherent property of the muscle. Uh, we think this is due maybe to enhanced cross bridges that occur as the heart stretches. We think it may also have to do with changing in calcium sensi uh, sensitivity. Um, but either way, the greater stretch that we have you know, upon um, the, the, the ventricles of the heart, the greater contractile state. Now, there's a limit to this. Um, there are some situations like in heart failure where it's overdilated um, and we end up having you know, a, a, an issue ejecting blood. We'll talk more about that in heart failure later in this course. 
But again, the key concept here is just thinking how this allows us to match Venus return during exercise. And again, the primary mechanism we call this Frank Starling mechanism. And we think it has something to do primarily um, with enhanced cross bridges. Um, so we're able to produce greater force as those ventricles stretch. Now, after load, um, again, there's a lot of things, other things that can, can contribute to it. It's primarily aortic pressure and then uh, a total peripheral resistance or vascular tone. After load, again, is the, is the work the heart must overcome to produce, you know, a pump, right? The, the work it must overcome to pump. Um, now, like I mentioned, in a healthy individual, so this is here, stroke volume, which is kind of, you know, we're using as our surrogate measure for cardiac output, and then um, resistance, right, outflow resistance, resistance in the left ventricular outflow tract. This is, um, again, as resistance increases in a normal, healthy individual within a certain range, right, we're able to keep stroke volume and cardiac output re relatively stable right we don't see a huge drop off we get to a certain point we start seeing you know stroke volume reduce the heart just can't maintain can't increase, increase contractility to match that demand right so normally when we have you know a higher afterload we increase contractility to maintain stro uh, stroke volume and subsequently cardiac output in hearts that have heart failure, which you'll learn a lot about, they are very afterload sensitive, meaning that any increase really in resistance, they're going to drop off a lot faster. This is why certain conditions can be very, very lethal um, with, you know, if they they have issues with, with heart uh, with, with you know, heart failure, they have issues with uh, blood pressure, and potentially even during exercise, the, the pressure changes that occur during exercise. And this is just another graph demonstrating this, um, looking specifically at arterial pressure, like, like we mentioned. Vascular tone, outflow resistance, and left ventricular outflow tract, as well as blood pressure, contribute to the afterload. Again, the work the heart must work against to pump, you know, blood out of the heart. And again, as you see, you know, within a normal, within a within a a range, right? We and this is mean arterial pressure map. We're, we're able to keep cardiac output relatively stable, but after, you know, a point say it's about 180 mean, we start seeing it rapidly, you know, decline. Um, and this is why there's a, there's a blood pressure that you guys will learn about, I'm sure in fundamentals courses, you'll definitely learn about our hypertension course um, called critical blood pressure, which corresponds to a blood pressure about 180 uh, systolic or 120 diastolic. So we start having serious issues with blood pressure and it's due primarily to this, as well as the uh, autoregulation curves, which you'll learn later on looking at the vascular system. But it's because, again, you know, we're able to tolerate increases in afterload to a point. Again, the left ventricle does have the potential to remodel. We can increase contractility. So we have ways to tolerate acute increases. We have ways to tolerate, you know, long-term chronic increases in blood pressure. But over time, these will begin to fail as well as if pressure continues to increase past a certain point, um, the problem is, is why, you know, early detection is key because of these adaptations that we're able and, and our, our range of tolerance, hypertension can go completely asymptomatic, even up to extremes because we can tolerate those increases before pumping performance really begins to suffer. The problem is though, usually by that time, we've kind of done our damage. So the key is really to assess early on. This is kind of a graph that really demonstrates that. So contractility. So the scientific definition of contractility is the intrinsic strength independent of external forces or soccer mirror length. Um, you can think about it really as this pumping function ability. And the surrogate measure for it would be left ventricular ejection fraction, again, influenced by this. These are different factors. You can also look at uh, inotropy, which is really calcium sensitivity. Um, and, you know, the more, the greater calcium sensitivity, the greater number of cross bridges, which increases the velocity of, of fiber shortening. And that allows us to create greater pressure independent of the length. So again, um, 
contractility can be influenced by preload. We talked about the Frank Starling mechanism. Afterload obviously can kind of influence cardiac or, or contractility because if it increases, we will subsequently kind of increase contractility, force reduction. Um, and then inotropy, which is uh, affected by calcium sensitivity. Um, and again, that'll allow us to increase cross bridges and subsequently force generation.